Shalom and welcome to Shikol Da'ad. I'm Rabbi Josh Rose. A curious detail in the text of the Torah this week gives rise to a difficult but important lesson for us. In Parshat Bo, the plagues come to a climax with Makot Bechorot, which is the death of the firstborn. Now, every year at Pesach, parents find different euphemisms to conceal the horror of the story or simply skip it altogether. Nobody really wants to go into detail about this plague while their own firstborn child is sitting around the table playing with the various plague puppets. But the Torah is quite direct. In the middle of the night, Hashem struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of the cattle. Then the Torah zooms in on Pharaoh and pans out then throughout the whole land. And Pharaoh arose in the night, and all his courtiers and all the Egyptians, because there was a loud cry in Egypt, for there was no house where there was not someone dead. So we're going to start in on a little curiosity in the text here. So we're immediately struck by just the power of the language and the horror of the vision here. But we're going to look at the beginning of the sentence. Why are we told that Pharaoh arose in the night? Now, that's the kind of question we probably wouldn't think to ask, but our sages certainly did. There are, of course, many different answers, as we would expect. Some argue that this detail about his getting up in the night indicates that Pharaoh's courtiers had kind of given up on persuading him to send the Israelites out, and in their despair, they didn't even rise to wake him when this happened. So we're left with a peculiar, peculiar vision of the royal himself rising to wake up his servants, which is the opposite of what would be normal. Others see in the midnight rising an attempt to save face, Pharaoh's saving face, by ushering out the Israelites under the cover of darkness, perhaps hoping that he wouldn't be humiliated with his complete defeat somewhat hidden. Now, each of these comments and other rabbinic attempts to grapple with the meaning of the death of the firstborn in this moment leave us uncomfortable or even outraged. No matter the brutality of Egypt, the widespread death that overcomes Egypt is certainly the thing that should draw our attention. It's the most brutal form of collective punishment, and it's one that's endorsed by God. How can this not be our focus? How can this not make us squeam? The Jewish tradition stands for individual responsibility, so not only our moral intuition, but our own sacred texts seem to cry out against the death of the firstborn. So what sense can we make of it? A seemingly innocuous comment from Rashi on the sentence that we were just looking at opens up a door to a very powerful insight. Rashi's brief explanation on Pharaoh's rising in the night is simply mimitato, from his bed. The Kotzker Rebbe, many centuries later, would draw from this a profound insight. The Kotzker says, He, meaning Pharaoh, was a real heretic. He had witnessed all of the plagues, he was well aware of them. He knew all that all of Moses' warnings had come to pass. Now, he warned him, Moshe warned Pharaoh, all the firstborn will die. Nonetheless, this evil man disrobed, climbed into bed, and went to sleep with an untroubled heart without any anxiety or fear. So, this image that the Kotzker presents of a man sleeping soundly in his bed while doom overtakes his society and shrieks of horror rise up all around him is truly haunting. The Kotzker frames Rashi's comment as a devastating critique of a leader's total indifference to the suffering that he sees. But let's get back to that suffering itself. Even to ask the question, how can the death of the firstborn be justified, seems immoral, given the indiscriminate death it brings down. How could God do such a thing? Now, I don't know that we can answer that question or that there even is an answer to that question. So let's set aside the impossible by changing our question a bit to this. What is the meaning for us of the death of the firstborn? So I'm going to share a story from the Talmud that sounds at first glance to be completely unrelated 
to this question. In a discussion of the Shabbat prohibition against carrying objects from one domain to another, we learn that animals also may not carry anything on Shabbat and that their owners are responsible if they do. The Talmud tells us of a cow that was known to belong to Rabbi Eliezer ben Azariah, the great first century sage, and that cow would go out on Shabbat carrying a strap between its horns. Wondering how it is possible that such a pious sage would ignore established law and flaunt it in this way, the Talmud concludes that in fact the cow did not belong to him, but to a woman who was one of his neighbors. So why, hundreds of years later, the rabbis want to know, do we still refer to this as Rabbi Eliezer's cow? Shlomi Chabav Nikrat al Shemo, because the Talmud says he did not protest her action, and it became associated with his name. That is, he let this woman's transgression pass and didn't say anything to her, and therefore we know that we call the cow by his name, Rabbi Eliezer's cow. The critical ethical principle underlying this odd story is then teased out. Kol mi she'afshar limchot l'ansheveto v'lo micha nitpas al ansheveto. Anyone who is able to protest against the members of his household and does not protest is punished for conduct of the members of his household. The teaching continues. Regarding the people of his town, he is punished for the conduct of the people of his town. The whole world, he is punished for the conduct of the whole world. As we imagine the dreadful scene of each household struck by Makat Bechorot, we focus on the morality of collective punishment. But this Talmudic teaching draws our attention to collective responsibility. There is, strictly speaking, a fair argument that to an ancient monarchy, we cannot apply the moral standards that we do to a modern democracy. Fair enough. But recall that the first steps on the pathway to redemption are cleared by those who refuse to cooperate with the evil gripping their society. First are the birthwives, Shifra and Pua, who rejected Pharaoh's decree to kill the Hebrew baby boys at birth and subvert it. Next is Moses' mother, who places in a basket a child that was by law to be drowned in the Nile. And then Pharaoh's daughter saves the baby and rather excuse me, saves the baby rather than obey her father's dictate, and she raises Moses in the palace. And finally, Moses himself, who risks his life to displace evil from its throne, once he has witnessed the suffering of the Israelites and taken it to heart. The death of the Egyptian firstborn bookends the horrific story that begins with Pharaoh's instruction that the Israelites be cast into the Nile as soon as they are born. Thus the Torah points us to the moral truth woven into the fabric of our world that we cannot avoid responsibility for the suffering in our midst. The question is not how could God so act, but rather how can we fail to act. All of Egypt was struck because all of Egypt, Egypt was implicated. Right now, as I speak and you listen, social ills that cannot be justified in a society of bounty pervade our cities and our states, the whole nation. We think of that image of the Pharaoh sleeping soundly as those around him cry out in agony, and we see ourselves in the Kotzker's dark portrait. So what then is the hope in this terrible, terrible story? The existence of the difficult truths of responsibility contain within them the very seeds of redemption. The death of the firstborn gives birth to the redemption of Israel, a nation instructed to remember each day the terrible suffering that they experienced at the hand of Egypt, to keep alive the hope that such evil can ever be overcome if we accept that it is Alenu upon us to rest from the moral chaos all around the blessings of goodness, righteousness, and peace through the work of our own hands. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great week.